four million years later. Hi there, thank you for downloading and listening to the 4 Million Years Later podcast, a show where two friends get together, watch an episode of the Generation 1 Transformers animated series, and then convene to talk about what they saw. We grew up with the show. We examine it from the standpoint of our vantage points, watch the show as children, and then how we think about it as adults today in the 21st century. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and I am joined by my co-host. Heavy Metal Who. <laughs> this is going to be your thing, I guess, huh? <laughs> the Master Hoover. Hooverbot <laughs> Island. Hoover Goes Hollywood. The Killing Jar Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we stand on the brink of the end of season one. How does it feel? This is it. It feels surprising. It feels short, and it is short yeah. because season two is, I believe, four times as long or maybe three times as long. I think it's three. Yeah, three. Three oh times my gosh. as long. That's going to seem forever. <laughs> So this is like the uh, courtship and the romance of yeah. working together on this thing. Yeah. That's <laughs> before, a good, very good metaphor. Before the Wanda Sykes thing kicks in, it's like, I see you woke up today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the final episode of season one, and what an episode. I was thinking about it when I was watching this one. It's like, why didn't they put the ultimate doom parts one through three at the end? Like, yeah. like modern cartoons would end with a multi-part cliffhanger season ender like beast wars did this a lot right like the first two seasons end with did everybody just get killed right (laughs) and and then it's like wow they're gonna fix that problem this one ends like in a fairly tidy way where it could have been the final episode of the series yeah i i would imagine at this point when they were writing and working on this episode that they knew that they were greenlit for the next season but maybe not i don't know how that works and how quickly they get alerted to the fact so yeah they could have still been under the impression that transformers wasn't going to be a hit and it was going to be all go bots all the time who knows (laughs) what what could have been in the ultimate (laughs) universe but so the 16th episode is entitled heavy metal war by donald f glut talk more about donald in a minute let's do the log line then we'll kick into the discussion Megatron challenges Optimus to a battle in which the loser and his team are exiled from Earth forever. There's a lot of forever in this series. <laughs> it's like you don't just have to do forever? something. You have to do something and stick to it forever. Forever. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, here's that part where I'm going to need a jingle because Jersey's going to talk about the way kids think, right? He's <laughs> like, you ask a child, like in the book Watership Down, there's like this idea that the rabbits can't count beyond four or something like that. It's like three or four is like the highest number. So then anything after that is a friar, which is like a thousand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so like El Hariah, the, the god of the rabbits is the, the prince of the thousand enemies. And I like this idea, like children thinking like, how long you been doing this? Oh, since forever. You know, mm-hmm. it's like it's been like four hours. <laughs> yeah. So I like I think that that like speaks also to the, like it, at least for me it speaks to the way kids think is that you you're gonna be banished forever, which means <laughs> until dinner. <laughs> <laughs> In kid years, that's forever. So Donald Glut. Again, he has written Divide and Conquer as well as both of the Dinobot episodes. So he has become quite the common Transformers writer. This is something I'm learning through doing this podcast. Mm -hmm. So if we go to any future Transformers cons, we'll have to see if Donald Glut is a guest. So we can go Mm -hmm. pester him with all these questions about the funky portmanteaus in (laughs) SOS Dinobots. (laughs) And every question we ask, he'll go, a wizard did it. (laughs) Next question. Yes, over here. Right. Haven. In episode BF12, you were battling barbarians while riding a winged Appaloosa. Yet in the very next scene, my dear, you're clearly atop a winged Arabian. Please to explain it. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, whenever you notice something like that, a wizard did it. I see. All right. Yes. But in episode AG4. Wizard. Ah, oh, for Glavin out. Well, let's go back to that advice I gave in an earlier episode where it's like, go up to him and, and notice something that was wonderful in the episode and say, oh, I'm sure you meant to do this, right? And he'll be like, yes, of course I did. And then you shake his hand. You get the satisfaction of paying a compliment. He gets the satisfaction of accepting genius. 
<laughs> so how does this one start? Let's tee it up. We're going to walk through the episode as we always do. Hoover, where do we begin? Well, we begin and we're at this place and there's people there and the people are doing a thing. Um, you got any more than that? Is that that's all the detail you got? Oh, sorry. It's just without Victor Caroli, I feel a little lost. He usually tells me where we are and what's going on. That's right. There's no Victor Caroli on the top of this one. Oh, no. Is this the last? Are we out of Victor Caroli intros? No, thankfully, I have heard at least one in season two. I think multiple in season two. <sighs> okay, good. <laughs> He's not gone. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. <laughs> but you're right. This opens up with like just like a desert scene. Art note. There's some really interesting color schemes going on in this desert scene. Like the foreground rocks are like are bright yellow and blue. Uh, the shading is all blue and like the sunlight hitting the rocks is bright yellow and the sky is like got a lot of yellow and pink in it, which I'd have to go back and check, but I don't recall seeing this kind of coloring in the sky in past episodes. I don't know why, but it struck me as I was watching it again. Mm. But well, what are we, we looking at? We can see that it's a very large construction site with like half, well, not even half, like we see the skeletons of buildings, as they say, and surprise, men in hard hats. <laughs> <laughs> which is like the platonic ideal of human in Transformer vision. And thankfully, the foreman is going to fill us in about what's going on since Victor Crowley doesn't want to. So far, we're right on schedule. Pretty soon, these energy disks will start tapping power from the Earth's magnetic field, and we'll have all the heat and electricity we need. And this, to me, sounded like it was Corey Burton doing a little bit deeper version of his brawn voice. Man, what a versatile actor Corey yeah. Burton is. He really is incredible. I mean, I, I am not being ironic at all. I am just so stunned when you hear that he can do that. And then he can turn around and do, like, Shockwave. What is your command, Megatron? Brainiac in the Superman Adventure series, which was like his version of the Outer Limits control voice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He helped me escape Krypton's fate, too. Now, all of our homeworld's memories are stored within me. Megatron in Transformers Animated. Fellow Decepticons, Megatron, your leader, speaks. For too long we have suffered under Autobot oppression, banished from our rightful home of Cybertron. Spike? Please help! Yeah. Wow. Because, like, yeah, you have to really listen for it, but I'm pretty sure that's Corey Burton, especially when he, like, screams for police in a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, suddenly, six light green construction vehicles are headed their way. But the foreman says he didn't send for more equipment. He then yells at the approaching vehicles, asking them if they heard him, which is pretty <laughs> ridiculous because I don't think anyone driving one of these loud things could hear anyone more than four feet away tops. Right. But it's at this point that he notices that no one is driving the vehicles. Yeah. Right! No one drives us, stupid human! We are the Constructicons! We drive ourselves! Uh-oh. Constructicons? It's time for that segment again. Heard only once before in Countdown to Extinction. So here we have our second case of new characters just showing up, which I am not a fan of. <laughs> and as for where they came from, more on that in a minute. I was going to say, yeah, like we're going to find out where they came from in an offhanded line. <laughs> 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 this is something that like I think I, oh man, because I consume these shows so repeatedly and so like ravenously as a person, as a young person, as a person growing up. I've gotten so accustomed to this idea of like, you want a new character? Just have them walk on. It's fine. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I, I find that this is one of those things that when I'm pitching graphic novels is one of the things that I always shoot myself in the foot on. And they'll say like, like, cause like an editor will say, well, where did that come from? I'm like, I don't know. They were just there. That's fine. <laughs> isn't it? I'm like, no, <laughs> you have to explain this stuff. I'm like, but, but for me, it was like exciting where it's like suddenly like, Hey, who's this guy? Beachcomber. Why is he suddenly there? Where'd he come from? I don't know, but he's cool. Let's watch, you know? Well, also, television was very different back then because oftentimes people missed episodes because there were no DVRs. You know, n not even everyone had a VCR in mm -hmm. 1984. Yeah. So it's like they could do things like that, and we just had to say, huh, did we miss an episode or what? I guess we'll find out. Mm. I'm trying to process how I feel about this. 
I understand why that would be off-putting to some people, but to me, it makes it feel more like I'm stepping into a lived-in world. Mm. I celebrate and cherish the aspects of this kind of entertainment that suggests rather than explicitly explains everything to me. I don't feel, I don't show up, and this is my personal thing, so I know I'm, I'm not necessarily in agreement with the world on this or even with you know a small majority, but I don't need like the system of magic explained to me. You know, mm. I don't need to have like the politics of that world explained to me. Just give me enough to like start making some guesses and predictions and and and, and smell some promise of something. So I like this that they just like wait a minute. There's these green tractors suddenly show up <laughs> and they're talking. Well, where do these guys come from? I <laughs> bet there's an exciting story ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we soon learn that the Constructicon talking is Scrapper, voiced by Michael Bell, who also voices Prowl, Sideswipe, and Bombshell. Mm -hmm. And these Constructicons steal the energy disc, which is a big <laughs> purple thing. That <laughs> it doesn't yeah. look much like a disc, for one thing, no, but it, it will look <laughs> really swell in Decepticon headquarters. This is one of those things where it feels like, oh, in the script it says energy disc, then it was sent overseas to get designed. And like, I don't know what that word means, but you know, I don't, I don't, English is not my first language. Let's just make up something cool. It's, it's, it's a cool piece of technology that they want to steal. Mm -hmm. All right, I can design something that looks like that. And it looks like mainframe's backpack from G.I. Joe, but like, but, but made for Omega Supreme. It's this gigantic <laughs> computer thing. <laughs> they obtain it and they lower it into the back of the dump truck and mm -hmm. soon. The human's orange construction vehicles head towards these Constructicons in an attempt to stop them. However, they aren't armed with missiles and lasers like the Constructicons are, so it's a very one-sided fight. Yeah, it's weird. Like, like it, they're just construction vehicles, these new Decepticons. But as soon as like the construction site guys start fighting back, on the dump truck, for crying out loud, two missiles pop out and fire <laughs> off. And then on the cement mixer, like a laser gun comes out of the top of it and starts firing at them, right? And the foreman lets us know that they're also taking the power converter. And the foreman yells, help, police, <laughs> which is crazy because it looks like this construction site is about a mile wide with no other buildings or population centers anywhere within earshot. Can, can we retcon a continuity here about this character, this construction yes. worker? Because he's already yelled at driving construction vehicles going, could you hear me? <laughs> And now he's just calling for police in the middle of the desert. Like, this guy has some kind of delusions of grandeur about the volume level of his voice. <laughs> right? Like, like his first calling in life was to be the let's get ready to rumble guy. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Uh, <laughs> that didn't work out. So now he's working at a construction site, but he's always ready to show off. Like, how, like his nickname in high school is Bullhorn. Watch this. <laughs> You're going to hear me on the ninth floor. Hey! And then it's like, oh, God, I hear you. So he's just like, he just thinks, well, let's see how far I can push it. <laughs> Police! You usually use a phone or a walkie-talkie. Not me. <laughs> they call me <laughs> well, Bullhorn Macintosh is what they call me back home. <laughs> <laughs> but when he screams help police that's where like the the cory burton spike voice comes through <laughs> you can hear it just just vaguely but yeah like like the constructicons are like sort of splitting up all over the construction site and just grabbing all sorts of stuff off of the walls like the power converter <laughs> is another purple thing that's just like sticking out of a wall with like a little satellite dish on it and i think it's hook who comes over and grabs it like the, the rather the um the crane hooks onto it and then drops it into the dump truck and once they have all the items they've come for a scrapper commands them to transform and we see their robot modes so the constructicons are all green and purple all mm. having a nice coordinated color scheme just as the insecticons did let's make a note of that the dinobots the insecticons and the constructicons all show up with like team colors <laughs> what do you think about the constructicons colors i'm not a big fan of green in general like you are but if we had to go with the green i like this sort of pale bright green that they are more so than a dark green but mm -hmm. i always thought it was weird to see construction vehicles in green because i never saw them colored that in real life so it just seemed oh like really Archie's supposed to be in disguise so I remember being put off by that as a child, too, going like, green, huh? Every construction vehicle I've ever seen is yellow. And then 
it was like one summer, like 85, 86, I can't remember, but we were on a road trip someplace and I saw a construction site where honest and for true, I mm-hmm. saw a tractor and a cement mixer th- that were all green. The barrel on the cement mixer was not purple. It was green. Mm-hmm. Cause I think, I think the cement mixer in the show, the barrel is purple or no. I don't remember now. I think it changes on the show, but on the toy, it was green. And I about lost my mind in that car. <laughs> it, it, the more I think about my childhood, the more I realize, like I was, I was kind of a lot to to deal with because, like, because <laughs> like you got a car full of like thirty, forty kids. It's like the Partridge Family times eight, and we're, we're on a road trip. So I'm like, it's hard enough with all those voices there, without having one kid like banging in the window, going, "Oh my god, <laughs> that's a green tractor." <laughs> I'm thinking like dad's probably going like, what is it going to hit us? What's going on? No, he's just excited because he saw a constructed car in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you get to see all of them transform. None of them have named themselves yet. Yeah. They just like look down at these guys, but Bullhorn McIntosh <laughs> takes three steps forward. Courageous man, right? He's like walking toward these 30 foot tall robots to be like, <laughs> what are you doing? And, and, uh, Scrapper's like foolish man of flesh. <laughs> <laughs> he picks him up off the ground and then drops him down, threatening his life. But yeah. thankfully, his eight co-workers below, they manage to catch him before he hits the ground. And it ends up looking like a sort of cheerleader routine. <laughs> yeah. Like when they throw the cheerleader up in the air and then they catch her. Yeah. So Scrapper orders that they now return to their master, Megatron. And the foreman deduces that they're with the Decepticons as the Constructicons fly away. And Victor Curley's off panel saying, I could have told you that. <laughs> we cut to an unknown location decorated much like Decepticon headquarters. And we see all the Decepticons standing around. Megatron notes the Constructicons arrival with the following exposition heavy line. My Constructicons have returned to our temporary base right on schedule. They were worth the time we spent building them in these caverns. Okay, so we're in a temporary base. I guess that makes plenty of sense. If you want to unleash evil construction vehicles onto the world, you might want a base that they can drive out of rather than a tower that rises up from the middle of the ocean that they have to fly out of. And we also get the only clue about where these guys came from. They were built in these caverns. All right. Now, the moment I came across this line again, I thought of the previous Hoover theory that you proposed for why the Dinobots are so slow-witted in that we have no vector sigma. So these are like the Commodore 64, you know, versions of Transformers. How do we explain how the (laughs) Constructicons are so clearly more intelligent than the Dinobots? Well, episodes we'll see much later show the Constructicons existing on Cybertron before the war. What? And even at the creation of Megatron, we'll see those in Season 2 and 3. So how could they be built in these caverns on Earth if they previously existed? Well, a very popular theory, and certainly one that I personally subscribe to, is that Megatron technically means rebuilding. Oh. It's possible they may have been found deactivated in another escape pod from Megatron's ship, as the Insecticons were, only damaged too much to have come back online at all, Mm. necessitating the rebuilding. Or they could have been stored as personality components on Cybertron, which we'll see later in Season 2. That's how we get the Combaticons. And new bodies would need constructed for them in that case. But I like the idea of them being in an escape pod or simply a ship of their own. And I came up with this idea that maybe before Megatron woke up, after four million years, Shockwave (laughs) sent them out from Cybertron. Hey, go find Megatron. He's been missing a long time. (laughs) (laughs) And their ship crashed on Earth, but not in an active volcano. And so they just all remained in stasis until they were rebuilt by Megatron and his bunch. So it might even explain this temporary new headquarters, the interior of which certainly looks like the insides of Decepticon ships. So maybe this little base is actually the inside of their ship, which crashed into this cave thing? Who knows? I see. That's just my personal little fanon for these guys. I just picture Shockwave chatting up Megatron one day, and he's like, so the Constructicons never came across you guys? I sent them out looking for you. (laughs) And this puts Megatron on the hunt for them. Ah. So that's just my theory. That's a good one. That's actually, that's not a bad theory at all. And it doesn't require a whole lot of mental effort to get to it, right? Mm Mm-hmm. 
It's using what we see on the screen, right? There's a, a, a base that's in a different place. Why would it be? Well, maybe that's the remains of the Constructicon ship that they found in the desert. Yeah. And if they're all beat up and broken from the crash, they would have to rebuild them. So, mm-hmm. And it goes along with Megatron's sense of self-aggrandizement that he wouldn't say rebuild because then he's not getting full credit. So he's going to say, <laughs> I built them. There you go. Wow. It all comes together. I can't wait to hear how you knit this all together in season three where the Constructicons and Megatron's origin gets reinvented again. <laughs> this is like mental contortionism. <laughs> Watch Hoover fit inside this little tiny box. That's what I do, kids. That's what I do. <laughs> well, okay, okay. Now I feel like this is cohesive. So after he says, oh, we, all the time, we, we, I spent building them in these caverns <laughs> by myself. I, Megatron, the greatest of all the Decepticons. The Constructicons all land in robot mode and stand in front of him. And so Megatron asks Scrapper for a report. He says they're all present and accounted for and goes down the list and conveniently names all the Constructicons for the viewers. <laughs> Scavenger. Tell your parents. Mixmaster. Tell your parents. Long Haul. Tell your parents. Bone Crusher. At your local store. Hook. On sale now. And himself. Got to get the whole gift set if you want to do the special thing this, these robots can do later on. He reveals that they obtained the items that they set out to get, and they begin attaching them to the other doodads in the cave. So Megatron says, like, did you get the stuff I told you to get? <laughs> Which I love that like, it's this moment. It's this very, like, domestic moment. Like, did, did you pick up the pickles? Did you get the pickles? <laughs> but, like... Instead of answering, Long Haul just transforms. And yeah. when he, like he's in robot mode, he doesn't have anything on him. But when he transforms into dump truck <laughs> mode, all the stuff is in the back of the dump truck. I kind of I find that kind of charming that he can just like put it someplace mm-hmm. it's inside him someplace. I don't know. He's a dump truck. You know, it makes total sense. I mean, with all the subspace stuff going on with like mm-hmm. Prime's trailer and everything. I mean, if if your job is to haul things as a vehicle mode. You got to put them somewhere in robot mode. You can't just be expected to carry them. (laughs) Yeah. Can you imagine long haul transforming and he's got all this stuff in the bed of his vehicle mode and then he transforms and then he has to just carry it around as he walks where he goes? Well, given what we learn about long haul's personality in future episodes, I like the idea of him transforming with a bunch of stuff in it and then it just falls all over the floor. He's like, (laughs) oh, no. (laughs) And he's like slowly picking it up on his hands and knees and like none of the other constructor cons help him. (laughs) No. Yeah, we're not going to learn anything about Long Haul in this episode for yeah. sure, but in the future we will. <laughs> and so Megatron reveals his plan. Soon, Starscream, soon. Scrapper's invention will give me the power to defeat the Autobots once and for all. Forgive me, but I believe your boast sounds vaguely familiar. We failed before through no fault of mine. But this time I shall not be denied. This device will enable me to strike at the Autobots through Optimus Prime's only weakness. His overdeveloped sense of honor. (laughs) So Starscream is being Starscream again. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, ah, we've heard this before, Megatron. As a matter (laughs) of fact, I think we've heard this about 15 times. (laughs) Maybe more. (laughs) And I like that Megatron's like, we failed through no fault of mine. What a <laughs> jerk. What a complete jerk. It's always your fault. It's always all. And he like points around the room. All of you. All of your faults. <laughs> like He's like Liz Lemon. <laughs> I'm watching you nerds. Don't screw up this time. But he's he's got a plan. Optimus' overdeveloped sense of honor. What could that mean? <laughs> well, we cut to the arc. Where we see the aforementioned Optimus as he, Ironhide, Cliffjumper, Wheeljack, Bumblebee, Sparkplug, Spike, and Chip have detected incoming Decepticons, or rather just one. But as Spike says, one is one too many when it's Megatron. Now there's some nice animation coming up here. The 2B.TV version, they're working off of that faulty print, right? Mm-hmm. Um, from yeah, the, the original, I think it's the one inch master tape. Where there's a lot of animation errors mm-hmm. in it. So Cliff Jumper is colored like Bumblebee. Yeah. And there's a lot of those kind of errors in this episode, especially. I'm not sure if they were fixed up before the airing. Sometimes mm-hmm. that happened. But in this scene, Cliff Jumper springs into action, as he often does, mm-hmm. and he shoots what I assume is some of his glass gas at Megatron. 
I guess. Megatron then gets frozen into a sphere in the air, and Cliffjumper looks elated. <laughs> Probably because this is the first time he's ever hit anything that he aimed for. And this is the part where in the animation, he like looks over his shoulder like, hey, look yeah. what I did. And I like to imagine he's looking for Hound. <laughs> <laughs> did you see that? I hit something. <laughs> you said I shouldn't have missed. I didn't miss. <laughs> but as soon as like he looks over his shoulder, he's like, hey, look what I did. We look back at the sphere floating in the sky. Yeah. And it's shattered. And Megatron just easily continues on his way. Yeah. And we see that Megatron is without his fusion cannon. What yeah. can that mean? So then Wheeljack unleashes his new shock blast cannon, <laughs> takes a shot, and the cannon explodes in his hands, sending him down to the ground. And then Ironhide steps in and fires some blasts at Megatron. And we get this great shot. Megatron gracefully avoiding the blast. He's practically pirouetting through the air with ease like a ballerina. Yeah. So how bold is Megatron here? He left his fusion cannon at home, apparently, mm. and he's confident he can just dodge and dart around all this Autobot laser fire. Potentially, there are 19 Autobots home because there are 19 Autobots who are typically in the arc. Yeah. So he could have stumbled upon 19 Autobots, and even with as bad a shooting as they are, that's <laughs> pretty bad odds <laughs> for him. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So then Optimus takes a shot, and Megatron continues through the air like a ballerina. He tells Optimus he's here to talk, not fight. Heroic and trusting Optimus tells the Autobots to hold their fire as Megatron lands. And then Megatron explains... I come about a matter of Cybertron law, Optimus Prime. Our war has gone on for millions of years. Decepticons fighting Autobots, in which opposing leaders, you and I, Optimus Prime... Made to battle. The loser must exile himself and his army to deep space for eternity. The winner may stay where he chooses. Do you have the courage for that? Yeah, so the reading that Frank Walker does here feels a little bit weird and clunky. Mm -hmm. It feels like a line got edited in the middle of it. Did I you think that there's too? a lot of editing and stuff that didn't quite make it into the episode. There's scenes that go on too long. There's scenes that are too truncated. Mm -hmm. The whole pace of this episode is off the rail. It feels like there's a lot of stuff that they either had to leave out or just couldn't get in. And we'll talk some more about that. Yeah. But pacing is just weird in this episode feels very rushed there's this line where he says like you know our war has gone on for millions of years decepticons fighting autobots in which opposing leaders you and i optimus prime mm -hmm. may do battle what does that sentence even mean like write it out it's a weird sentence and it feels like right in the middle where he said decepticons fighting autobots there was something else there that got trimmed yeah and also this is if we're keeping track the fhe cassettes the family home entertainment <laughs> cassettes this scene got used in one of those previews where the you know, the, the middle school vice principal did the read of, Will Optimus Prime survive a battle with Rumble? <laughs> <laughs> did it actually say that? No, there's one. It's Divide and Conquer in the, that preview. They said, Will Optimus Prime survive against the evil Laserbeak? <laughs> and it's the scene where Laserbeak is like shooting him in the chest when he's on the operating table. I'm like... Okay, you have a really dramatic image of like Osmos being murdered on an operating table, but then you got like this guy who's clearly like he's never done a reading before in his life. <laughs> well, he, I'm sure he had done readings before. I'm being I'm overly harsh on this, but it's just like as a teenager, I found no end of humor in the dissonance between the exciting imagery <laughs> and the very calm read. Anyway. So the other Autobots chime in with both distrust and encouragement that Optimus can take him. Since it's Cybertron law, Optimus agrees to the challenge. Megatron says that he thought he would due to Prime's sense of honor, and he leaves. Can we talk about what a dumb idea this is? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, like, I don't like to make fun of Transformers plots saying, like, oh, it's a dumb idea. But, like, this really is, like, you're going to gamble, Optimus? I mean, Optimus, you're going to gamble that you are going to do one-on-one -on -one combat with the guy who offered to do it, right? Megatron's asking, mm -hmm. hey, fight me one-on-one, -on -one, and if you win, we'll all go away forever. He's proven that he's crafty and cunning and sneaky, right? But it's uh, Cybertron law. 
<laughs> I know. I, I guess that's the, the angle they're playing here is that if you invoke the law, Optimus has to obey it and the bad guys never have to obey the law. And that's the difference between good and evil, right? <laughs> but it's just like Optimus could also say like, yeah, well, you know what? Extenuating circumstances, you're a creep. You play tricks all the time. I'm not going to jeopardize the safety of however many billion people were on Earth in 1984, plus the lives of my Autobots, just to make... But this isn't the only time Optimus does this either, where he's like, okay, I'll make a deal with you, Megatron. <laughs> and if and if you win, I'll go away. Yeah. But yeah, this is, this is a silly thing for him to agree to, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so back at the Decepticons temporary HQ, let's see, we need a name for this place. If the permanent HQ is Decepticon under the sea... And I'm going to christen this place Decepticon Inside a Cave. That sounds very English. <laughs> so Megatron announces that Scrapper's machine is ready as the Decepticons are all gathered around him. And we see all the usual suspects except for some of Soundwave's tapes. We even see all three of Reflector. Of course, no Insecticons, but as we saw last time, they're no longer on good terms with Megatron and his bunch. So then Scrapper pulls a lever and we get another exposition dump. Now, Decepticons, each of you must contribute a power chip rectifier to the exchange furnace. But I need my power chip rectifier. Besides, the Cybertron Code of Combat requires each warrior to fight as he is, without additional reinforcement. You wouldn't want to cheat, would you, Megatron? I will win by any means, at any cost. Even if it means terminating you, Starscream! I was only raising a legal point. I am not concerned with technicalities. Only victory interests me. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. This is something that's actually worth looking forward to in this episode. Something that Season 1 does, that Season 2 does less of is emphasizing that each robot not only has a primary function, but they have some kind of superpowers, mm -hmm. right? Each Decepticon, each Autobot has at least one special ability that only they have. Thundercracker's got his flame throwing. Skywarp can teleport. Starscream has the communal null ray. And so I think this is a neat story to emphasize and celebrate that sort of superhero aspect of this show mm -hmm. uh and, and i like the idea that there's like a little chip they can just take out and it's like oh there goes my powers yeah you know so like you could switch it out like starscream could go to you know like a dealer in the the, the back <laughs> streets of cybertron and be like i really really want to have x-ray vision uh, you got a chip for that yeah it cost you three energon goodies <laughs> we need to write lockdown into the generation one series oh i know oh man yeah i mean that's basically what they explore with that character don't they yeah. so after starscream raises his legal point <laughs> the exchange furnace opens and everybody walks up and does it you see like a whole bunch of hands like in front of the the fire dropping these chips in yep so every decepticon inserts their power chip into this machine as megatron all wired into the device absorbs all of the Decepticons' powers. And we see Megatron glow with power as he declares that Optimus Prime is finished. There's some nice animation here, too, where the, the strength transfer is happening. And not only do we get, like, this anime-esque thing when Megatron's like, all oh, your power! And, like, the, like the, <laughs> does, like, the scraggly lines on him to show, like, how intense it is. Mm -hmm. And then after the explosion happens, and everybody gets knocked down, and Megatron's just like standing inside of this chamber. They do this nice thing where they create the visual effect of how heat warps light, you know, like how, like when you mm -hmm. see like a mirage on the highway. Like the room is waving. All of the imagery is like like being distorted by all of the heat in the room from what just happened. Yep. It ends with Megatron telling us on screen, Optimus Prime is finished. He is literally all of the Decepticons now. <laughs> and he's going to fight Optimus one-on-one. -on -one. So that's a pretty good tension point to take a break and talk yeah. about Pow Pow Power Wheels. <laughs> pow Pow Power Wheels, Pow Pow Power Wheels, Power Wheels, Power makes it go. Maybe think for a moment that like we could use a friend right now to help us navigate this tension. What about my buddy? Or kid sister. For that matter, <laughs> that would be good. 
And then afterwards, we can all, you know, enjoy a fruit roll up. And calm the heck down <laughs> before we dive back into this intense story. Did you eat fruit roll ups as a kid? I did. Did you? No. <laughs> did you want them? I don't think I ever did. To me, they just looked like plastic. <laughs> they, they were. <laughs> It was just there's just like fruit pulp smooshed onto a piece of wax paper and you peeled it off. <laughs> mm, colored plastic. It wasn't very like satisfying and it kind of hurt your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we all have cancer now. <laughs> but I remember my mom would get the uh the store brand, you know, like the generic brand. It was called oh. fr- fruit skins or something like that, which is even better. <laughs> have some fruit skins. <laughs> So when we come back from commercial and Starscream, as we well know by now, he has some notes about Megatron's plan. <laughs> he does. He thinks Teletran 1 will be able to detect the deception that they're pulling. But Megatron has already thought of this, and he sends the Constructicons on their little mission to destroy Teletran. There's a neat moment here where uh, Megatron... He doesn't waste a whole lot of time shutting Starscream down, right? No. He's like, it's like if, hey... Tell Trend One, if he detects your deception, he'll alert Optimus Prime. And Megatron just goes, You won't! And then he turns to Scrapper. <laughs> Scrapper, you have your orders. Get out of here. And everybody else is like bracing themselves for another like showdown. But they're like, Oh, okay, that was it. That's all he's got today. <laughs> he's just like, Shut up, Starscream. <laughs> he's also absorbed all the rest of the Decepticons' impatience. <laughs> <laughs> Little known side effect of uh, I- I- absorbing power chip rectifiers. <laughs> I'd also uh, like to point out that so far, the only Constructicon to talk has been Scrapper, and we're nine minutes into the episode at this point. Wow. Okay. So, just in case you thought we were being remiss on discussing the other Constructicon's voice artist, we we will once they talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the Constructicons are flying to the Ark, which means that we, the viewers, are headed to... Well, we cut to the Ark as Spike is worried about the upcoming battle, of course. (laughs) Prime says Teletran will warn them of any shenanigans. Putting a real fine point on that, again, this is a very heavy-handed episode where they reinforce points over and over. (laughs) That's true. Like, we just heard Starscream say... So this is an interesting thing that I'm noticing as a pattern is that Starscream and Prime always wind up saying the same things. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. I wonder if it's like a brother from another mother kind of thing. Now we need an episode where Prime and Starscream are trapped in a cave together. (laughs) Yeah. This is okay. This is the IDW series we need to propose. It's just a never ending series of two Transformers stuck in a room episodes. (laughs) What would Prime and Starscream talk about together? Boy, I hate Megatron. I hate Megatron, too. He never listens to me. He never listens to me. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the Starscream just said, Teltran 1 will know. And then Ops was like, in case you missed that, Teltran 1 will warn us. And he says, the time for the battle approaches. Optimus's dialogue is also really stiff in this one. Yeah. We're not getting like the John Wayne relaxed Prime. And we're not getting like pensive worried prime we're just getting like noble prime this is we're like follow the law prime <laughs> yeah. yeah there's some weird stuff i got a problem with with his like adherence to the law later on in this episode I'm judge dread is driving optimus prime this this episode <laughs> okay you betray the law so the autobots roll out to meet megatron and his bunch at the park for the showdown did you ever did you ever have any kids in school like fight each other at the playground at the end of the day so you know yeah i know that this is what we're like hearkening to here is the whole meet you at the playground at three o'clock kind of thing (laughs) um i don't remember fights in the playground being that formalized when i was a kid like it was more (laughs) it was more of a spontaneous thing that just sort of broke out Mm. Uh, you'd have a kid like flicking another kid in the ear over and over again and all of a sudden boom it's a fight but it like was never (laughs) like all right let's synchronize our casios and (laughs) three o'clock sharp i'm meeting you we're having a showdown everybody goes ooh, that was only on tv in my experience what about you i remember one specific fight that was definitely scheduled and i got to see the scheduling and then yeah. by happenstance i also got to see the fight and it was it felt sort of exciting as like oh this is what they were talking about earlier here's where they fight <laughs> yeah 
was it was it satisfactory? Did uh, you feel it? it kind of was and wasn't because the next I guess they made up pretty soon after the fight, so mm. it was like, uh it's like what <laughs> what you, was the you, point of that? You were hoping that there'd be some like top turnbuckle action and then like some <laughs> some of the heels friends show up in the ring and some of the faces friends show up in the ring. As God is my witness, he has broken in half. I thought there'd at least be some power chip rectifiers involved. <laughs> But so the Autobots and Decepticons meet each other at this ravine in the middle of the desert. And there's actually some cute moments coming up here. Because like Megatron's like, oh, welcome to defeat. And Optimus like, oh, defeat. But our battle has not yet begun. Oh, Optimus, you're such a drag in this episode. <laughs> and then he's like, well, as soon as our respective armies take their places, we'll correct that oversight. Oh, Megatron, what is it with you guys? <laughs> and then the Autobots and Decepticons start like sliding down the sides of the ravine to take their places to, to watch the fight. And Ironhide's carrying Chip Chase in his hands, and it's super, super cute. <laughs> and the Decepticons get seated on the other. Well, the Autobots are sitting on one side and the Decepticons on the other. Yeah. It seems like everyone should be here, but there are some noticeable absences. I did not see Skyfire anywhere in this episode. Hey, you're right. I also couldn't see Gears in any of the crowd <laughs> scenes, so... He's off being grumpy somewhere, perhaps. <laughs> I like that you were looking for him. Uh, where's Barrage? Uh, I'm right here. Where's Gears? Oh, I don't know. Nobody seems to ever miss Gears. Well, I, again, I get the sense that if, if anyone's not going to be invited to things, it's going to be Gears. It's like, oh, <laughs> let's not invite him. He just ruins all the parties. <laughs> and so we need a story where there's Reflector and Gears in a cave. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, Everyone always, always tells, tells me tells to take a break. take a break. That's what everybody always tells me. Maybe people don't like us. Do you think it's something we did? I don't know. <laughs> so be sure to look out for our new Transformers comic series from IDW. It's going to be called In a Cave. In a Cave. Trapped it's going to be kind of like Marvel Team Up, but it's going to, just going to be called In a Cave. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the battles are verbal. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, so over at the Decepticon side, we see everyone having a seat. There's three reflectors there. There's the three Seekers, and there's Soundwave, who we see even ejects Laserbeak and Ravage so they can watch the battle. And Soundwave even pets Ravage as Ravage sits down. Yeah, I have to think you must have loved that one little Mm -hmm. moment. Ravage, like, sidles up to Soundwave like a kitty cat, and Soundwave, like, strokes his head. Now, this is Ravage, who talked... In episode two of the original series, like the you know the rocket bases due west of the Autobot camp, like we know he's a sentient dude, right? He's not just like a like a, a cat. Well, cats are sentient, but I mean like he's not like <laughs> I mean like he like talks to you, right? Like so like this this again just keeps just keep dumping giant piles of weird on top of Soundwave. <laughs> like let's make him weirder. How how can you make him weirder? He's got a little family that lives in his chest. What if he strokes their heads? Like like a father and a child. Ugh. <laughs> God, it's weird. <laughs> but at the same time, it's not because like Ravage is a cat, so I I, I get petty cat anyway. I do have to point out that we don't see frenzy amongst the people. Well, so. watching gladiatorial combat is a geeky assignment. <laughs> I, I like the idea like a frenzy not being there, where like he opted out of putting his power chip rectifier <laughs> and sound wave because like his little family and his chest comes first. He's like, okay, well. You don't say anything. I won't say anything. <laughs> Maybe Megatron forgot you exist. He's only seen you one time. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Actually, do we know if Megatron saw Frenzy? Because like Fre- Frenzy was getting pushed down that hole by Skywarp when Megatron <laughs> showed up. Yeah, but Rumble had already jumped on Skywarp's face at that point. So. Oh, that's right. Okay, never mind. <laughs> So Prime and Megatron meet on the battlefield and they lay out the rules. Loser, vanquished to deep space forever. forever. <laughs> Which he said that nine minutes ago or eight, Again, six minutes th- ago. This episode, man, they're yeah. hitting everything home as, as much as they can. Yeah. I feel this is as good as point as any to talk about it. I feel like the other Donald F. Glut scripts were not this heavy handed. So I don't know if maybe it got edited and someone was like, oh, this is a show for kids. You got to write down to them. You got to make sure they understand. Yeah. I don't know. 
but this one way more so than any of his other episodes is it just feels like a GoBots episode or something it's just very heavy handed and talking down to the audience let me say that this episode has a lot of really neat stuff in it but mm-hmm. the dialogue feels very rigid it feels it feels almost like you're reading one of those old storybooks that came with like a book and record when we were kids where like mm-hmm. the it's clear that they haven't thought a whole lot about the characterization and how we can get the characters to see each line in their own way which is surprising because Donald Glut's written so many episodes up to this point so yeah. I do have to wonder if some kind of interference happened in the episode interference maybe that's not the right word collaboration happened in the episode that, <laughs> that well, I think a, I think you're kind of showing which side you are on uh, <laughs> in writer versus editor. <laughs> you're deceptive, kind of showing Jersey. Whoops, whoops, whoops! I meant collaboration, <laughs> but no. But I mean, co- collaboration means that there's going to be some give and take, and there's going to be some things that you change in order to like please the whole team and so on. And and this, yeah, you're right. I, this feels this has the odor of let's make sure that everybody understands exactly what's happening. So let's have the characters say the thing out loud again. <laughs> but now we get some kind of cool action, cool imaginative fighting. Mm-hmm. We see Prime and Megatron shake hands, <laughs> but Megatron's hand cackles with energy. So, of course, this is because he used Partly's power chip, and we all know that Partly was the Decepticon arm wrestling champion. Oh. That's a deep cut to episode two, kids. You got to listen to all of our episodes in order. And that's another IDW series we're going to do where Partly and Cloudy go on the road for an arm wrestling championship and they drive a truck together. And Partly is constantly like lifting weights in the truck. And when he turns his hat around backwards, like he gets turned into a machine and he can stop anybody. And he reinforces his relationship with Cloudy. They learn to love each other again through this adventure of a road trip and an arm wrestling competition. They're best friends. <laughs> that's how they became best friends. <laughs> So his hand crackles with energy and then like, they can't wait to get started and neither can I. You hear like the Autobots all go like, whoa, 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 what? (laughs) And then it closes in on Megatron's face and he smirks right at Optimus Prime before he does what? Still holding his hand, he flings him across the canyon. You got to stop this guy before he really gets going. And Prime is like, uh, what just (laughs) happened? Yes, that was an incredible move. Yeah, like he, this whole scene Optimus keeps responding to every attack with like, I didn't know he could do that. Right. <laughs> Again, more heavy handedness. Prime yeah. is like, oh, I didn't know Megatron was that strong. And then a blast from Megatron's fusion cannon hits Prime. I don't think his opponent's got a hope of hurting him now. And we begin to see Starscream doing color commentary on the match. How about some fair and balanced commentary? Color commentary, is it? Or is it Starscream overly <laughs> explaining what's happening on the screen to us? <laughs> But at the same time, it's very characteristic of Starscream because he's going like, hey, look at Megatron's doing awesome stuff with my power chip. Right. <laughs> and he's telling Skywarp, who doesn't care? <laughs> <laughs> so Starscream points out to Skywarp that Starscream's power chip gives Megatron's access to his cluster bombs. Okay. Well, Prime <laughs> is somehow able to fire a blast from his hand back at Megatron, Shades of Gobots. What does he think he's doing? Mm-hmm. And that knocks Megatron back a bit as the Autobots cheer. I've never seen a crowd so fired up, JR! And Spike screams, Zap him good! <laughs> and then the barrel of Megatron's gun mode, which is usually on his back, flips down to his side and fires at Prime, as Starscream <laughs> takes credit for that as well, thanks to his Null Ray. I think it's pretty obvious which way this one's going to go, JR. He used my null ray, too. He says just like that. And, and I like th- what I love about that is that this is the first time I think he calls it his null ray, right? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> up until then, it's been the null ray. But he's like, well, Megatron can't hear me right now. So it's, <laughs> it's my null ray. You see that? <laughs> it would have been great if Megatron just stopped what he was doing and said, what? <laughs> <laughs> the null ray, the null ray. He's waving his hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, then Megatron kneels and uses his fusion cannon on the ground like a pile driver, rumble mm-hmm. style. And he opens a big crevice in the ground, which, of course, happens every episode. <laughs> yeah. He's just showing off for the crowd now. And Ben Prime falls into the crevice, but he manages to grab the side of the cliff before he falls very far. And in the Decepticon bleachers, we see Rumble turn to Thundercracker and smile, knowing that it was his power chip that it allowed it to happen. For all the clunkinesses in this episode, I do like that that, like, like Starscream has to do an elaborate extended brag. But all the other Decepticons need to do is be like, yeah, you see that? That's me. 
<laughs> give themselves a thumbs up, which is fine. I mean, that, that shows us that, yes, he used Rumble's power. That's clarity. Mm-hmm. And, and it shows the difference between Starscream and every other Decepticon. And then Prime picks up a giant boulder and hurls it at Megatron. Uh-oh! Only for Megatron to disappear before it makes contact. What strategy? Mm-hmm. Then Megatron appears behind Prime as Skywarp brags about the use of his power chip. Skywarp's like, well, Starscream's going to run his mouth. I might as well, too. Well, and what I like about that is that, yes, Starscream has been running his mouth. And so now Skywarp's like, yeah, shut up. We all got powers. You should see me do that when I got my power chip. Right. You know what I would do? I would vanish from here right now, Starscream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, poor Skywarp can't teleport away from Starscream anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, that, that would be a good uh, background scene to put in uh, in past episodes. And Starscream's like, ah, I'm the greatest. Megatron fell down. And Skywarp's like, oh, brother. <laughs> this takes off. Zap. Anyway. So then Megatron fires his fusion cannon at Prime's back, and Optimus falls to his knees. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> now we find out Megatron told us earlier what the Constructicons were gonna do. He says, like, when I'm fighting Optimus, the Constructicons are gonna tunnel beneath the uh, Autobot headquarters and then enter the control room and destroy Teletran One. That's what he told us that was gonna happen, and now mm-hmm. we cut to the Constructicons tunneling through the rock beneath Autobot headquarters. And we hear Scrapper warn Scrounge that the volcano is still active. Yeah. Now, Scrapper just named all the Constructicons a few minutes ago, and there wasn't one named Scrounge. No. It turns out that this was an early name for Scavenger that got overlooked in the script and did not get changed. Oh. It's also a clumsy line because, as a kid, I puzzled over it because he says, careful, Scrounge, this volcano isn't inactive. Right. (laughs) Nice double negative. Yeah, which I get it. He's saying it's it's not exactly active. It's not like exploding right now, but it, it isn't inactive either. It could be active. So, but when I heard the lines, kid, it's like, I, is, did he say it is indeed active? Mm-hmm. What is he saying there? Because like you got the the vocal effect going on. You got Michael Bell using that gravelly voice. So all around, just that whole line is super weird, and it and it like always caused me to step back from the episode. And like, what what was that about? Yeah, like, who's scrounge? <laughs> And it's only now, 12 minutes into a 22-minute episode, that <laughs> the second Constructicon talk. Oh. And we have Scrounge, I mean Scavenger, voiced by Don Messick, who also does Ratchet and Gears, and a very obscure cartoon character some of you may have heard of named Scooby-Doo. Over here. I don't know who that is. It's no robot, so I'm not going to be interested. Scrapper, I'm picking up computer signals from above. We're directly under Teletran 1. But there's no time to hear the other Constructicons as we must rejoin Prime and Megatron's battle. Come on! And Prime is really hurting now. He manages to call on the big man upstairs, Hogan style, and narrowly misses shooting Megatron in the face. Oh no! I don't like the looks of this! You see a little bit of animation where this laser fire goes right by Megatron's head. Wow. So Prime tackles Megatron, Uh but then Megatron blasts off, and he blinds Prime with Reflector's blinding attack, sending Prime plummeting to the ground as the Autobots react with shock and horror. What strategy? Yeah, like, he's like, Optimus grabs Megatron, like, around the chest, and Megatron just, like, sort of shoots straight up in the air. Mm -hmm. And so Optimus' face is sort of in Megatron's chest, and then his chest just lights up really bright. Yeah. Which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but okay. And then Optimus falls to the ground. He says, you cannot blast what you cannot see. Optimus falls, and he says, nor what you cannot hear. And now we see something that I don't think we've seen before on the show. So Megatron blasts Prime with some sonic waves that come from his hands. And Starscream spells out to Skywarp (laughs) that Reflector and Thundercracker must be proud of their power chips. Uh, If I were at Skywarp at this point, I would just sort of get up and say, I'm going to go over there. (laughs) That would have been good. Yeah. (laughs) Look at at, what a good job their power chips are doing. Isn't that nice? All right, I'm going to go sit by Reflector. (laughs) Now that's rejection, Starscream. (laughs) Then Megatron fires another fusion cannon blaster prime, and that weakens him, then blasts him again and sends Prime down to the ground. Flat on your back with your shoulders on the mat is no place to be. Climactic music in our second commercial break. Oh, man. So, yeah, uh, Megatron says, you know, you were good. 
but you weren't good enough to fight Megatron. And so the battle ends. And when he shoots Prime one last time, he Prime falls right into the view of the camera. His face is falling to the ground. It's, he's almost falling in slow motion, though the frame rate isn't high enough to make it look like slow motion. It just looks like <laughs> he's just kind of falling in this like jagged, clunky way. But then the, the music swells, and we go to commercial break. And man, Optimus is dead once again. And then people's got to hawk products at us. Oh, well, Honeycomb is going to make us feel a lot better. Honeycomb cereal, part of this big, complete breakfast. You know, I think some stress eating might be in order, and those honeycomb boxes are awful big, so I guess I'm on board. But we could wind up becoming distracted by Zack the Lego Maniac, who builds them big and builds them small. And maybe, maybe, maybe we can find some solace in building something. With stress eating and building things out of Legos will make us feel better. But then... We're shocked back into reality by the horror that is Supernaturals. They change to fight with ghostly might. Turn them into the light and they change into even more powerful creatures. Now, the wine in me is free. Take this. Ah! Holographic ghost monsters. <laughs> I can't deal with this existential dread. I have to find out what happened to Optimus. I'm tuning back in. We open with Prime on the ground, writhing and smoking. Prime blames himself for not realizing, again, that Megatron had so many powers. Yeah, he's like, I was not prepared. And Ironhide's like, well, I'm prepared to knock those deceptive bums all the way back to Cybertron. And then you hear the Autobots are like, yeah, let's get him. No, Ironhide. <laughs> Optimus is a stickler for the law and won't destroy the honor of the Autobots. Yeah. So they have to leave Earth. Forever. <laughs> forever <laughs> but first they have to go back to base to, for repairs yeah prime gingerly transforms into truck mode and huffer politely offers to haul prime's trailer for him yeah so we get to see huffer in truck mode pull up and take over the trailer i do love this moment this is a really cute moment because first of all huffer's a little tiny truck and he's mm -hmm. you know and and he's like he's it's like he's trying to help dad, you know? It's like, oh, man, I see you're hurt. Let me let me try to help. And and Huffer's the guy who always says it can't be done. This time he's yep. saying it can because it has to be done. That's it. This moment has always stood out to me as like mm -hmm. one of the really sweet, cute moments. And then even when Optimus says, like, you're a true friend, Huffer, as he like pulls away and gives Huffer the trailer. And then he, he says... He doesn't bother telling Huffer that he could have just sent the trailer to subspace and just <laughs> drove home by himself. But he wanted to make Huffer feel useful. Yeah, let, let the kid have a win. But then, then he says the line that was also in the FHE cassette, Autobots, roll out. And then we hear him whisper to himself, perhaps for the last time. <laughs> so they roll out for home, yeah. and the Decepticons follow to ensure that Prime keeps his word. But back below the Ark, the Constructicons are figuring out how to get up through the floor to get to Teletran 1. And Scrapper must get the assistance of another Constructicon. And here's our third Constructicon, voiced by... Seriously? Okay, this is Frank Welker again, yep. voicing Mixmaster. This is Frank Welker's 11th Transformer on this series. <laughs> and this explains why Mixmaster sounds crazy, because I imagine at this point Frank Welker has gone crazy, <laughs> grabbing so many characters to voice. But as we'll see in the future, he's still not done. Now, so let's paint the picture of what the scene looks like. They're in the, this cave in a volcano that's surrounded by lava. Like they're on the, like sort of like a bank of a lava river in this cave. And mm -hmm. th that, that's important for what's going to happen later on in the episode. And above them, as uh, Mixmaster is like mixing his acids and burning a hole in the floor, we see Teletran 1, we hear an alarm going off, and Teletran 1 is showing a schematic of each of the Constructicons on mm -hmm. the screen. It's like, uh oh, there's that guy down there, 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 and they all seem to be Decepticons, and they're all coming up now. So as the hole appears in the floor and Teletran 1 is making this noise, suddenly, and this is where we get to a cool thing, like I know I was poking fun at the idea of Optimus putting the Dinobots in a closet when he doesn't <laughs> want to deal with them, but there's something that is so, 
there's something that's so oh I, I I how do I describe it? I want to say charming. I don't know if charming is the right word. As a child, this was an electric moment for me. Is that wait the Dinobots just like sort of like sleep, and mm. when they're needed, they wake up and they come hurt whoever needs hurting. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I live my life, really. <laughs> I just think about as a child, when you're in your bedroom alone and the windows open a crack, and I remember this very clearly. Like, Actually, did I ever tell you the story about the remote radio-controlled R2-D2 toy that my parents had to return? I don't think so, but I also had that radio-controlled R2-D2. So I'm a little kid. I'm like in like third grade or whatever, and we got the radio-controlled R2-D2, which was radio-controlled, which is different than remote-controlled back then. Remote-controlled had mm-hmm. a cord. Radio was like you had like a receiver you know and yep. sent radio signals to the thing to make it do stuff if i didn't properly turn that off we lived in a very rural area but there was like this just down the road was this weird trucking station it was sort of like this like big concrete building where trucks would go and park and i don't know what business they did there but there was always be a bunch of semi trucks and sometimes they would just be on all night like the, the truckers would be in there taking a break from being on the highway and if they talked on their cbs it would activate the r2d2 <laughs> So now it's three o'clock in the morning, right? I'm in my bedroom. It's dark. The windows are cracked open a little bit. The summer breeze is coming in. All of a sudden, R2-D2 springs to life, mm-hmm. right? I I loved R2-D2. I didn't love him at three o'clock in the morning when I was trying to sleep, and I don't know what turned him on, you know? <laughs> and so my parents, like, they just, like, took him back to the store instead of being like, oh, you're just turning him on. You're leaving him on at night. You should turn him off, right? Instead of, like, we're making it go away because it scared right. you too much. <laughs> Thanks for solving the problem, Dad. <laughs> But but I think about like this moment, what it feels what it feels like to me is it's this feeling of there's these big, kind of scary, kind of brutish Autobots and they're in the closet and they're waiting. Mm-hmm. Some something bad happens, some bad guys are coming in, we'll wake up and we will hurt them for you. <laughs> <laughs> the monster under the bed kind of idea, right? But these are like the good monsters are gonna stomp the bad monsters. Where are the constructicons coming from? They're coming from the floor. Right, the coming in from under the bed. I <laughs> I don't think Don Lefglut was thinking about this, but this is how it resonated with me. This is me meeting the story halfway to go like, oh, that's why this scene feels good because there's also it's kind of dangerous music playing. There's mm-hmm. like the alarm music, the Teltran one, and then when the Danavots eyes start flashing, you hear the da 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 da, you know, and then also bump bump bump, and then you hear like the horns come in, bump bump bump, bump bump bump. Teltran one calls. Dinobots respond. And Grimlock slowly says, Teletran one calls. Dinobots respond. Ah! Oh. <sighs> and that's another thing we need to point out is that Teletran doesn't actually say anything. No. Anywhere in this whole episode. No. Nope. Which makes us remember that when Cliff Jumper actually hit Megatron, he didn't say anything either. Mm. So it seems like maybe Casey Kasem couldn't make it to this recording or something good observation or maybe he remembers the time a few episodes back where he had exactly one sentence in an episode and <laughs> now he only comes in if he has more than five sentences or something casey Kasem's agent talked to <laughs> wally burr it was like look butthead <laughs> don't do that again you know you want casey in here he has six lines or more <laughs> so the constructicons transform and they're like they say, there's Teletran 1 for Megatron. Destroy it. And we get a great <laughs> line where Grimlock's like, no, destroy Teletran 1. <laughs> Dinobots destroy you. And they attack him. They start, and like, when, they sh- when he shoots, it cuts to the outside of the volcano. Mm-hmm. And we see a hole the size of like five school buses get blasted <laughs> out of the side of this volcano. <sighs> And the Dinobots are like pushing them out with fire, uh, like shooting at them. The, the construct guns are all backing away. And now we get Snarl actually gets a line. Sludge's like, oh, I've never seen these Decepticons mm-hmm. before. And Snarl's like, no, not see again either because we <laughs> dynamite them to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, another nice line by Slag was like, yeah, the Dinobots, no fool around. And Grimlock's like, right, transform. I'll turn into dinosaur mode. And this feels pretty good. This feels mm-hmm. really good because we just watched Optimus get his butt kicked. And, you know, the construction guys were about to murder Teletran 1. So it's <laughs> like, finally, some tides are turning here. And, you know, it's like you got, like, all of these, like, the sleek new guys who are always, like, more powerful, right? Like, mm-hmm. you always have to introduce the new toys and have them be better. Well, we saw the Dinobots in two episodes. They scared Megatron. So I don't care how many of you Constructicons are. They're all in dino mode now, and they're facing you down. Yep. 
Even the Constructicons chime in about this. Yeah, they're really getting their tushies whooped. <laughs> then we finally hear from a fourth Constructicon, Hook. It's bad news, Strapper. They brought out the heavy artillery. And Hook is voiced by Neil Ross, who also voices Dinobot Slag. Yep. And this also has some really nice animation here because, like, Sludge stomps his foot on the ground and a crevice opens in front of the volcano. And then Slag, like, shoots fire at the crevice and then, like, it erupts into flame. <laughs> and now there's lava in the in the crevice. And then as we look at Hook, it's this cool, like, three-quarter upshot where Hook's hand's, like, closer to us than his face. And we see, again, that distortion of heat in the screen as fire flies across the screen. He says, oh, yeah, they brought in the heavy artillery. <laughs> so... Scrapper says what? Then it's time we did the same, only heavier. Constructicons, transform! Phase one! What? Phase (laughs) one? Everyone goes into vehicle mode, and then he commands transform phase two. And suddenly we see extra parts unfold and appear from the vehicles, and the Constructicons begin merging together. And gentle listeners, we get our very first combiner in the history of Transformers. Not only is each Constructicon a robot and a vehicle, but each one becomes a part of a gestalt, or a combiner. The six Constructicons merge to form Devastator. This will go on to become a very overused shtick. But at this point in the mythos, this is the first time they're bringing a super robot concept into the Transformers. Yeah. Of course, several Japanese cartoons, such as Go Lion, which is Voltron, had pioneered the multiple robots form a bigger robot shtick. But here we see it applied to the Transformers universe for the first time. Yeah. Enjoy it now while it's new and novel, for this is a well they will go back to several more times. This is also interesting devastator is unique in a lot of ways compared to the other combiners that we meet later on and one of the features is is that scrapper the apparent leader Mm -hmm. is the right leg yeah of the robot right most of the combiners even in voltron the head is the leader Mm -hmm. i'll form the head and when we get to the other combiners later on that that tends to be the case but how weird is it that the leader is the right leg of the robot? Hook yeah. becomes the head. Probably zero thought went into that. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, though. I like that idea. Uh, like, you know, one would think. But one of the things they do with Devastator's voice, which you got to talk about in a second after the, he forms in Devastator, is they really emphasize creating a sense of it's all other voices combined. It's a new mm. voice, but they put a lot of reverb on it so it feels like it's echoing from multiple mm-hmm. voices coming together. So it gives the impression, again, who knows how hard they were thinking about this, but it gives the impression that their personalities are also merged, not just... Mm-hmm. So it, at that point, it doesn't matter who the leader is because you're all operating together yeah. with this composite personality. And we hear Devastator speak aloud his first line. Devastator has his own independent voice from the individual Constructicons, and he's voiced by Arthur Burghardt, famous for doing the voice of Destro in G.I. Joe. <laughs> A fitting end to this absurd scheme. But of course, it's very reverby and echoey sounding. Yeah. Uh, Arthur Burghardt doesn't play a whole lot of Transformers characters, does he? I think this might be the only one. Wow. Wow. To leave a talent like that on the floor. I imagine, you know, he was already there for a G.I. Joe session. It's like, who are we going to get to do this character? (laughs) Let's find someone who's already coming into the studio. And they heard the Destro laugh through the wall. (laughs) They're like, I thought those walls were soundproofed. They are. (laughs) We cut to the Autobots returning home. Spike sees the battle. And is wondering just what in the world that huge robot squaring off against the Dinobots is. And Ironhide wants to help, but Prime forbids it, telling him to remember the law. Yeah. That's weird. I don't think the bet was loser leaves Earth within a half hour of the fight. But (laughs) Optimus feels like he's on a real timetable here. But why can't they help? Okay, so the Dinobots are Autobots too. They're part of the Autobot army. So when Megatron mm-hmm. says they must be exiled to deepest space, if the Dinobots are engaged in something, this part has always confused me. Why would they leave the Dinobots behind? Yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. So inside the Ark, Wheeljack and Ratchet 
fix up Prime, good as new. But in the meantime, Chip has used Teletran 1 to analyze Prime's injuries, and has learned that the damages came from multiple Decepticons. We see pictures of all the Decepticons appear on Teletran's mm-hmm. screen. And again, Teletran doesn't say anything. No, he doesn't. It's just he keeps flashing it while you hear like the alarm sound again. And then yeah. and it's Wheeljack who says, of course, mm-hmm. somehow Megatron used the powers of all the other Decepticons. Mm-hmm. Which means they cheated, which means that they do not have to adhere to the bargain. Yeah. We overshot. Like there was a little bit of a fighting between Devastator and the Dinobots where like they're each Dinobot one by one. Grimlock, come on, make your team operate as a team. <laughs> but like one by one, they keep running at Devastator. And like in almost a preview of the fight in Transformers, the movie, he's just like flicking them aside and like yep. throwing them around. So when they say like we don't have to keep our end of the bargain, Autobots, the time has come to fight back. And by the way, during this time, like Optimus is like apparently better than new, according to Ratchet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you could have done that before he went to go fight Megatron then. (laughs) (laughs) But then, so like when we go back outside, when the Autobots are like, okay, let's go fight the Decepticons, we see the Dinobots are kind of in rough shape and Mm -hmm. Devastator's standing over them like, aha, nothing defeats the Devastator, nothing. (laughs) But then suddenly an even louder booming voice emerges. Nothing, little one. (laughs) What would you say about me? And the Decepticons turn, stunned, to see a robot even bigger than Devastator. What in the world? And I love how prophetic this moment is. (laughs) (laughs) It's like his kids are like, six robots to form one robot. That's the biggest robot I've ever seen. And Hasbro's like, really? Let's see what else we can do with that. (laughs) Because like, Metroplex, Fortress Maximus, Unicron, it keeps on going. (laughs) But yeah, like in, it's a pretty cool looking Floro Dairy designed robot and Peter Cullen voice. And hey, congratulations to Hound. Can we give him a round of applause? Because he came up with a hologram that actually was like not only convincing, but effective, right? Instead of just like, we did, we did, we did. <laughs> well, he spoiled it. But at this point in the show, we don't know that this is a hologram. So yeah. Cut back to the front of the arc. And Optimus and the Autobots fire upon Devastator while he's distracted. And Prime says, now, before he realizes. Yeah. And the blast hit Devastator square in the middle. And Devastator falls apart into his six component characters. Yeah. The Constructicons try to haul out of there. But the Dinobots whoop up on them. And in the Constructicons hurry to flee, they drive into a crevice full of lava. And they sink into it. Yeah. Like, so the Dinobots, like, get up and they're like... They get their second wind, and they like they start shooting lasers out of their horns. Snarl shoots lasers out of his nostrils. <laughs> the Constructicons are like running away in vehicle mode, and then the screen flashes with an explosion, and then we just yeah. see like the edge of the the crevice with the with the lava, and each of the Constructicons just like fall in, <laughs> and they they fall in and melt in lava. <laughs> we had one episode, one episode. They turn into giant robot mode, and you know they died. Oh wait, this is Transformers, you know. <laughs> We are, we've already had this ruined for us with Skyfire. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's then that we see the giant Autobot is merely a holographic image made by Hound, and it disappears, having done its job. Yeah. Although I think I would have waited for Megatron to see if he was going to retreat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Hound's like, oh, this is using up a lot of energy. This is bigger than most of my holograms. So he turns it off, and then the Decepticons realize it was a hologram. Yeah. But the Autobots are not a hologram, so they begin firing upon the Decepticons, and the Autobots charge them, and many of the Decepticons fall backwards into that same lava-filled crevice, and only Megatron is left. His Prime tells him he won't have to worry about the powers of all the Autobots, just him. Then he takes a well-placed shot at Megatron and blasts him into the lava as well. Yep. So all the Decepticons are conveniently splashed down in the lava. Right outside of Autobot Base, yeah. right. Let's let's make a note of this. They're right in. They're right across the welcome mat. They just fell into lava. So if they come out, mm, <laughs> they're probably gonna know, you know. So like, and then Optimus stands over the crevice and looks down. We're looking up at him, and Spike's next to him. He's like, "It is ended." Oh, Optimus, why are you talking like that? <laughs> and Spike's like, "Oh, is it really over? Have we really seen the end of the Decepticons forever?" <laughs> And then Osmus says, who could say, Spike, in this vast universe, is anything truly forever? Mm-hmm. Again, a weird line. It was like, in this vast universe, is anything forever? 
You know, well, if it's a vast universe, maybe, <laughs> maybe the universe is forever. I mean, it's a weird line, but then like, then we cut down to the lava and what do we mm-hmm. see? We see Megatron rise up from the lava and he declares, we shall rise again. And the episode ends with that familiar motif that Megatron seems defeated, but he'll be back. But he's right underneath Optimus when he (laughs) pops up and says, we shall rise again, right? Or no? Well, we don't really know how far that crevice went. Maybe it sort of like drifted off like a river. Okay. And they're they're sort of down lava stream by now, out of eyesight, hopefully. (laughs) Yeah, it's I get what they're doing there. And I love that idea of the like we've celebrated this in the show from the beginning is that ending with Megatron being the only guy who, quote unquote, survives. But like this business of like Optimus is looking right down in there and Megatron yeah. pops up. It's like, we'll rise again. It's like Optimus could be like, no, you're not. And then, you know, blast him one more time. <laughs> it's weird and it's kind of awkward, but it's like it feels oh, I don't know how to describe it. It feels like it's it's hitting the points that we expect it to hit, but it's not doing it in a way that really feels like crafted and elegant and again i feel like this this whole episode feels like it's been edited in really weird ways Mm -hmm. i do like how it sort of mirrors the end of more than meets the eye part three as well as countdown to extinction part three where like megatron seems defeated but then at the end of the episode we realize he's still alive yeah and i like that kind of mirroring but uh it doesn't quite pull it off as well yeah i mean but it's it's a cool looking shot you know Mm -hmm. with the lava on his face and everything Mm mm-hmm and I mean, yeah, we didn't, I, I don't remember if I knew this was the final episode of the season. I, I'm sure I didn't as no, a child. There would have been no way for us to know back then. Yeah. But it, I mean, it, again, it's a very memorable episode. I remember a lot. I watched this one a lot because I had the FHE tape. I remember watching it on Saturday morning. I remember it being in the, the cycle of rotation when it was airing after school. I don't know. I don't know. What's your 10,000 foot view of this one? Well, I like the plot. I like the ideas behind it, but it just seems way more heavy handed than any other episode in the series. Yeah. It's like some, it feels like someone had been watching this and said, guys, you're supposed to be making a cartoon. You're making adult science fiction here. Mm. You know, you have characters dying that we have to bring back. You guys need to remember your audience here and they're mm. six year olds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as as a person who works in a creative industry, it's fascinating to come up against some of the assumptions people have about what young people need and, and expect. Mm-hmm. And and I don't mean to say that as like, you know, I have all the right answers on this. Like I learn a lot by in, engaging with and talking with people um, on different creative teams about like how to do this. So it's and, and, and hearing anecdotal evidence and then also like studies and things like that, like what what developmentally um, kids are ready for. So there is a push and pull, at least in my experience on creative projects with regard to that. And I could and it this episode totally feels like the product of somebody stepping in and saying, like, guys, the, you're, you're suggesting too much and offering too little, which you and I have like pointed a flashlight at that and said, like, that's really cool that they do that, you know. Mm-hmm. Like the, the Transformers transition of Autobot symbol to Decepticon symbol is being a way to very subtly suggest that we're switching air uh, locations without mm-hmm. saying, meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice, right? Yep. But this one feels like it's taking a step towards, meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice. Let's have the characters state the stakes multiple times. Let's mm-hmm. have the characters state the potential points of conflict in the story multiple times. The Autobot's computer, Teletran 1, will detect your blah, 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 you know? Even Scrapper says twice, we're directly under Teletran 1. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, it, it does feel like it's it's like intentionally redundant at times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we'll have to pay attention in Season 2 to see if that rears its head again or if it was maybe just this one episode or what. But yeah, hopefully it's not going to be commonplace because I love these stories, I love these characters, and I don't want to see all this talking down to the audience because as we've seen in previous episodes, this makes for a great sci-fi show in that the stakes are higher than a show like, say, Super Friends. Or, mm-hmm. you know, any other cartoon. This seems a bit more science fiction-y 
than all of those. Not just because there's giant robots, but because it's not talking down to the audience or setting things up in a very cheesy, kidified way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, kidified. I, I I just want to like elaborate on that word because I know it gets thrown around a lot to mean like poorly written or dumb. I feel like this isn't necessarily. And what, what's what's also ironic about this episode for me, to use Megatron's word, is they dialed it back to make it more simpler in an episode where the central conflict is two guys beating the living heck out of each other, mm-hmm. right? It's like the mm-hmm. most, probably I would say, physically violent episode of the first season. Yeah. <laughs> Yet they made it so that it's more approachable to like by maybe five-year-olds. I'm like, well, that seems weird. Like maybe mm-hmm. you could have done that with episodes like Fire in the Sky, where it was more about internal conflict, but maybe the internal conflict would have been too abstract for a five-year-old. Anyway, yeah, it's it's weird. And like it was kidified in the sense that it feels like they made the dialogue intentionally more simple and redundant Mm -hmm. for maximum clarity and sometimes you can be so clear as to to slow everything down so yeah rather than the usual like young adult level they bumped it down to intermediate level to use a book metaphor there you go so so yeah it's 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 weird i'm one of the my takeaways, which we'll talk about probably in the next episode when we do our season one sort of overview, is that episodes that I had, I remember having a lot of fondness for when I approach it with this level of attention. I'm like, eh, it's not actually that great. And episodes that I remember kind of liking, I suddenly discover a whole new level of appreciation for. Mm-hmm. And this is yeah. one of the ones where it's like, if you were to ask me a year ago, what's one of your top 10 episodes? I'd be like, oh, Heavy Metal War for sure. <laughs> and now I look at it and I'm like, it's okay. Yeah. One memory I do have of watching this as a kid is being very shocked at the reveal that there was a bigger Autobot than Devastator. Mm. I was like, ah, who's this? <laughs> How cool would that have been if it was a real Transformer? <laughs> And it's like, and it's like the size of the USS flag. Only one hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> tell your parents, kids. Only <laughs> a steal. Uh, he could even turn into an aircraft carrier. <laughs> he does look a little bit like broadside if you look at him. A little bit, yeah. So, essentially, seven new characters this episode. <laughs> if you count Devastator as his own character, wow. And we didn't even get to hear from two of them. Neither Long Haul nor Bone Crusher got any lines. Wow. That, that, again, leads to the fact that maybe stuff was cut out of this. Yeah. It's just it's just bizarrely paced. There's that scene where Megatron and Starscream are just standing there in the base for what <laughs> seems like two minutes without any dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then there's other and scenes where they just rush past. Another observation I have about season, like this episode in particular, but a lot of season one episodes is the sound in like the the recording quality it sounds older i know there's very little time between the end of this episode and that first episode of the next season but when we get to season one or rather season two episode one i want us to listen for how it sounds different the sound quality Mm. changes dramatically and in this one it it has that kind of crispy gravelly kind of noise to the recording that makes it feel like oh this feels like it's from the early 80s or late 70s and suddenly Mm -hmm. like the 85 season comes around like i don't know what they did at wally burr studios but like the sound is so much richer and cleaner in the next Mm -hmm. one something to watch out for next time so but but yeah it's weird right like we get like they parade all these new characters on tell your parents kids kill them off at the end (laughs) of the episode and like we really do we know anything about the constructicons personalities Mm -mm. like we get something from the performances we got the fact that scrapper really loves megatron yeah scrapper's Um, very bossy he loves telling everyone what to do and like we get that smarmy line from hook but it really doesn't tell us much Mm -mm. you know then with mixmaster we know that he's like kind of a scatterbrain mad scientist kind of character maybe and that's all we can really deduce at this point (laughs) yeah so a lot of weirdness. I mean, the f- just the fact that th- this is our first combiner and we don't even see the Autobots react to him at all. Yeah. Yeah. You'd think there'd be a whole scene like six Decepticons merged yeah. to form one giant Decepticon. But that ends up working out pretty well for continuity, I think, because in season two, we'll learn that Devastator was on Cybertron before the war. Yeah. So 
you know, maybe Devastator wasn't new to the Autobots. It was certainly new to Spike, of course, but yeah. maybe the Autobots had seen him before on Cybertron, and that's why they don't react. I mean, sure, this is the first time they've seen him on Earth, but maybe they were aware of his existence before. Good eye. Good eye, because I've never understood that way. Like, uh, Spike is riding inside of Prime. He's like, Prime, what is that thing? Mm-hmm. And then, like, none of the Autobots react. And then, like, when Prime's Ironhide... Like, the law! The law, Spike! <laughs> Spike, there's law to follow. <laughs> Optimus was studying for uh, his law degree at the time. <laughs> and he became a little hypervigilant. But like when the only Autobot who reacts is Ironhide, and he just says, our dino buddies, we got to mm-hmm. help. Yep. Right? Like He doesn't say, like, what That's is that it. big green thing? You're right. right. Good call. I'm so smart. I'm so smart. I'm so smart. I'm so smart. But as far as introductions go, you would think they would have the Autobots be, oh, how could we possibly defeat such an amazing robot? To, you know, <laughs> that, that you kids must purchase. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you would be fools not to get this because he could beat anybody. Like yep, I, there's there's nope, a there's a cute that. moment in uh, the 2001 Robots in Disguise series where Rail Racer appears and I think he's the first combiner we see. Mm-hmm. And like it it cuts to the Autobot brothers uh, Sideburn, Exbron and Prowl and they're looking at you like, "Whoa, they could combine. I wonder if I can combine with you guys." <laughs> nah, I don't wanna. <laughs> <laughs> so so like at least they address this idea that like because like I remember when I was uh, when I was in my twenties and I thought that I had all the right answers about what Transformers <laughs> should do and I had this the, I, we've talked before about like the the comic that I wanted to write which was about how Optimus recruited all of the uh, the Autobots who we see in season one mm-hmm. and there was going to be this other story this like sort of B story that was going to be my defense of how Starscream is actually the greatest Decepticon patriot <laughs> and not the greatest traitor. <laughs> and it was going to be surrounding the idea of Devastator. And it was going to be that Starscream was actually kind of with Megatron most of the way. And then Megatron comes up with this perverse idea of turning six robots into one big robot. And it's such a horrific image in Starscream's head. Like, imagine, like, taking six people and smooshing them together, right? Like, <laughs> I got a big person. That'd be weird. It'd be like an unholy cheerleader monster, you know, like a cheerleader <laughs> pyramid monster, which I explored in a, in a comic called Art School Girls. <laughs> It was called her name was Cheer Beast when the six cheerleaders combined into a giant cheerleader. But it was gonna be that, that was the line that, that was too far. And Starscream's like, I I will never support you on anything ever again, Megatron, because this is an abomination that you've created. And Megatron reveals his plans, like, oh no, I've got plans to do a whole bunch. We're gonna do a whole <laughs> mess of these guys. And it was gonna tie into like why Starscream made his combiner in season two as like a way to like like that's him crossing his own line he's he's mm. crossing the rubicon now he's just as uh, as nasty as megatron hmm. but again i was like 21 you know 20 i i didn't really know how to write that good yet <laughs> <laughs> some would say i don't i still don't but um <laughs> but i i like to think I've, I've got a little bit more sophisticated ideas than that now but anyway so so look for our new comic from IDW, Transformers in a Cave. <laughs> Different characters each month. Trapped in a room with the Transformers. <laughs> uh, we've addressed the pacing. There's like a few nice moments of animation, like when Megatron's yeah, floating around. there's a few. <laughs> but it's this episode was clearly worked on by different teams. Mm-hmm. We see one shot of Devastator where he has like the usual sunglasses, but then in other shots he has like the individual red eyes. Yeah. So there's just a lot of inconsistency like that. There's definitely moments of nice animation sprinkled in, but they're only sprinkled in, sadly. <sighs> well, there we go. Uh, a mixed bag to close out season yep. one. <laughs> So what's the plan? Next week, we're not diving into season two, right? No, next week is sort of our catch-all season one look back. Anything that sort of fell to the side as we were discussing any of this stuff, it's all up for grabs. Mm. Our thoughts on the 84 toy line, our memories of getting it, anything along those lines. Or it, who knows? It may be a short episode, maybe a long episode. could be a super long episode. Who knows? <laughs> but, That's uh, true. We'll just be waxing philosophical on things related to season one of Transformers. As a deep breath before diving into the <laughs> abyss 
That is season two. Diving into a very long 49 episode season two. Holy moly. Well, that'll take us all the way into 2021. Yeah, we'll be we'll be like 80 years old by then. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Hoover. There's There we go. Dusting our hands as we move on to the next chapter. <laughs> And until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of 4 million years later.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I am Heavy Metal Hoove. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas-mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 million years later and you can email us at 4 million years later at gmail.com visit 4 million years later.com and if you haven't yet please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts you know how it works <laughs>